Uh, it's a very warm welcome to everybody who's uh, logged on here on this rather dreary November afternoon here in, in Braunschweig. Um, temperatures are down to five degrees Celsius and it's um, it's uh, it's late in the day here. It's um, much earlier for our guest of honor today, uh, Kyle Munkel, who's at uh, uh, the University of Baltimore in his office, I believe. Um, and we're really happy to have Kyle with us today. He's Assistant Professor of Communication and English um, at the University of Baltimore. Uh, he's worked with uh, Tom Leach, who's also here uh, for a long time uh, at the University of Delaware um, some time ago. He's the author of Adaptations in the Franchise Era, uh, 2001 to 2016, and that was out in Bloomsbury 2019. And um, we are, in a way, I think, sort of allies in the field uh, with a common interest in um, streaming, fandom, gaming, theme park adaptations, um, a rather so sort of wider view on um, what kind of adaptations we can and should discuss. Um, warm welcome to all the students who are here. As usual, I think I, you know, don't be distracted if there is things going on in the chat in parallel with your presentation. These are things, um, you know, issues that maybe we want to address then um, after you've you've done your lecture uh, and we've tried out the, the PowerPoint. It should work. Um, so we're really happy that um, we could organize this, and we're very much looking forward um, to the paper, which is I think maybe related to his his, his work. Um, uh, the title is Live Action versus Animation. Uh, I think these are texts that we might be familiar with. All of us. Or, or many of us, maybe. What was yours, Kyle? Uh, thanks for, um, for doing this for us tonight. Thanks, Eckert, so much for having me. And I'm going to go ahead and put folks my um, contact info, my Twitter handle, and my email in the chat in case you have comments that you want to direct um, there as well. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'll just say by way of very brief, brief preface, this is um, drawn from a book project that I'm working on right now, specifically on the history of live action animated hybrid films. And as I probably told Eckert some time ago, it's a little more adaptation adjacent perhaps than adaptation direct though. Trust that we will, we will, um, we'll get there. Um, it's a, inspired by a, a sort of subset of adaptations that I became fascinated by a few years ago. So with that, Let's watch some SpongeBob. Let me get started here. Okay. The climax of 2004's The SpongeBob SquarePants movie finds SpongeBob and his best pal Patrick stranded on dry land in live action, quite the predicament for the 2D co-stars of Nickelodeon's long-running animated series. The pair square off against the so-called Cyclops, a flesh and blood dude in full diving gear, intent on turning SpongeBob and Patrick into beachy baubles in his Shell City gift shop, like the many dried up sea creatures adorned with glued on Google eyes that surround them. As SpongeBob and Patrick dehydrate on the shopkeeper's desk, which you can see here, petrifying from animated characters into a live action kitchen sponge and starfish, they shed tears that short circuit a nearby outlet, setting off the shop's sprinklers and reviving our protagonists, as well as the surrounding seahorses, lobsters, octopuses, and fish, all of whom come to 2D animated life ready to revenge themselves upon the Cyclops. This exceedingly weird scene, which also features intermittent fourth wall busting cuts to a live audience watching the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, blurs the boundaries between live action and animation to hallucinogenic effect. In an ironic twist, the live action environment becomes deadly for SpongeBob and Patrick, stocked as it is with unconvincing Google-eyed approximations of cartoonishness. Such creatures can only survive under the sea, in depths more easily reached by animators than by live action feature filmmakers. The Cyclops is a trespasser in the incredible, exceptional, extraordinary, and very animated Bikini Bottom, from whose outer limits he abducts SpongeBob and Patrick. And yet, live action also spurs the pair's return, not only in the droplets of water that pop them back to 3D, excuse me, uh, 2D life, but also in the guise of a superhuman David Hasselhoff, on whose tanned back they catch a wave home as he skims through the ocean like a speedboat. 
Meanwhile, the live audience watching this drama unfold includes a babbling parrot, a reminder that some creatures can speak in real life too. As its fourth wall crumbles, the SpongeBob SquarePants movie erodes any sure border separating live action and animation. The SpongeBob movie's climactic trip nods to the long, strange history of live actors diving into animation and cartoons shoring up live action, both in the figure of the Cyclops, whose name recalls Ray Harryhausen's famous stop-motion creation from the seventh voyage of Sinbad, and in the saving grace of the Sprinkler, an inversion of the acid green live action dip that spells certain death and doom for the 2D denizens and eponymous hero of 1988's Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a clear influence on the scene. Live action has livened animation and animation has animated live action from film's earliest days to its latest, from the live action hand that reaches beyond another fourth wall to animate a stick figure clown in Emile Cole's Phantasmagory, to the computer animated fingers that snap half of life out of action in the Russo brothers' Avengers Infinity War. To be sure, Thanos' lineage runs through dozens of animated characters, among them King Kong, the Three Caballeros, Pete's Dragon, and Roger Rabbit, who have crossed into our live action world, while Black Widow's fateful trip to Vormir in Avengers Endgame follows many live action crossovers into animated worlds before it, with destinations ranging from the black and white wonderland of the Alice comedies, to the chalk drawing diversion of Mary Poppins, to Roger Rabbit's Toontown, Ralph Bakshi's Cool World, and Space Jam's Looney Tune Land. SpongeBob and Patrick's landfall stretches at least as far back as the middle of the 20th century, when the practice of combining live action with cartoons was standard enough for director Nick Grind in a 1946 issue of The Screenwriter to muse on the future of the quote, part flesh and part ink talking picture. In fact, the practice wasn't just standard, but stale. Grind ventures that the Three Caballeros, released just two years prior, woke a dozy Rip Van Winkle that had laid dormant since Max Fleischer, Walter Lance, and Walt Disney's bipartisan experiments with Coco the Clown, Colonel He's a Liar, and Little Alice in the 20s and 30s. Grind notes the mixed reception of Disney's latest mixed production, quote, There is no doubt but that the galloping paintings mingle most convincingly with the live girls on the beach, but after a bravo for the achievement, there was a tendency to say, so what? before suggesting an assortment of stories better suited to animaction. Older hits like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, The Wizard of Oz, and Grin's own Babes in Toyland that could be remade to further cleave the real and the fantastic, and equally fantastic fare like Jack and the Beanstalk, The Odyssey, and The Arabian Nights drawn from the public domain, quote, which means that they will have no story cost outside of the fortune which will be paid to the screenwriters who adapt them to the screen. Though Grind makes no mention of sponges or starfish, his suggestions predict in no particular order the dreamy interludes of several Technicolor musicals to come, Harryhausen's stop-motion monsters, with Grind recommending that disagreeable fellow named Cyclops as an excellent subject for the blended technique, and Disney's continued live-action animated tinkering. Grind imagines a future where mixing animation and live-action won't be stale, but every day, where, quote, the infiltration of cartoon technique will not be called to your attention any more than the countryside outside of Spencer Tracy's window is advertised as a trick. To announce part cartoon and part flesh would be as unnecessary to a film with a legitimate story appeal as a listing of Betty Grable's chemical ingredients, intriguing as they might be, end quote. With the advent of digital animation, Grin's future has surely arrived. Not only in the fantastic Leviathan that the Avengers battle in their headline, headlining 2012 film, but also, for instance, in Iron Man's red and gold and almost entirely computer-generated getup. Grin's recommendations proved prophetic in a different way, too. The live-action animated film evolved over the course of 100-some years, primarily through adaptation, taking its inspiration, as Grin suggests, from pre-existing books, movies, shows, comics, characters, and or stories. Of the roughly two dozen specimens I've mentioned so far today, all but four share DNA with some prior source. Glancing back at the Academy Award winners for Best Visual Effects in decades past, we'd stumble across any number of largely literary adaptations that combine live action and animation, 
Mary Poppins, Bedknobs and Broomsticks, Roger Rabbit, Jurassic Park, Babe, What Dreams May Come, All Three Lord of the Rings, The Golden Compass, Life of Pi, and The Jungle Book. But we'd find no parallel prevalence in, say, the winners for Best Animated Feature, which includes only four adaptations since the award's inception in 2002. Consider the similar difference and distance between Bakshi's 1978 Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson's trilogy from the 2000s. As Camilla Elliott herself does in a 2015 essay on unfilmable books, wherein both Jackson and Life of Pi director Ang Lee cite the development of digital and CGI technologies for making their adaptations possible. Special effects, as much as the sources themselves, serve as the raison d'etre for these adaptations, a point I've explored elsewhere in relation to the rise of literary franchises like Harry Potter and The Hunger Games in the 2000s and 2010s. Hybrid films, it would seem, are just special or just real enough. Grind himself ventures that if it's fantasy you're after, you can find no better starting point than an actual place with real familiar faces. By its very nature, fantasy is a divergence from the real. You may as well start it as matter of fact as you can. As in adaptations, familiarity paves the way for novelty. In my lecture today, I want to examine three specimens, sorry, we'll skip past Oz for the moment being, three eminently adaptable rodents from two different moments in the live action animated film's evolution. Jerry Mouse from 1945's Anchors Away, Alvin Seville from 2007's Alvin and the Chipmunks, and Pip from Disney's Enchanted released the same year. These three specimens suggest that live action animated films, beyond their status as adaptations, are more fundamentally about adaptation itself, with both the film's characters adjusting to new worlds and the film's makers adjusting to new technologies. The live-action animated film as a particularly dominant adaptational species splits the difference between what Thomas Leach, taking off from biological metaphors of cinematic adaptation, calls transitive and intransitive adaptation, or adapting from, X adapts Y, and adapting to, X adapts to Y. Live action animated hybrids are inherently intransitive, not only insofar as they find artists, quote, adapting the drawings to what actually did happen in the existing film, as Grind writes, but also insofar as they explicitly and graphically dramatize how characters adapt to, as Leach says, new circumstances, new cultures, and new media. For starters, the SpongeBob SquarePants movie finishes with Patrick and SpongeBob struggling to adapt to their live action environment unable to move from one medium, the sea, to another, the air. Only the salty secretion of their tears save them. They're more successful in the movie's 2015 sequel, Sponge Out of Water, where Sponge and Starfish surface on a live-action beach as 3D computer-animated superhero versions of themselves, its own nod, maybe, to the fittest live-action animated hybrids of the time. The third SpongeBob film, this year's Sponge on the Run, abandons the series' 2D aesthetic altogether, though its now permanently 3D protagonists still find themselves in live action on dry land, seeking advice from a sage named Sage, face and voice of Keanu Reeves, in an extended dream sequence. A banner ad for Paramount's streaming service, home to Nickelodeon, shows the different dimensions of SpongeBob's evolution, a reminder that the shows and movies makers are as much adapting to new popular animation techniques as they are adapting SpongeBob its or himself. We need only glance back at the list of visual effects Oscar winners once more to see just how often audiences, critics, and industry professionals celebrate hybrid films for ushering in the future, for making evolutionary leaps in motion picture technology. Live action animated films dramatize on screen the intransitive adaptation taking place off, as, <clears throat> again in Leach's words, the once perfect adaptation becomes less and less well suited to its system. Special effects laden hybrid films only make this point more obvious. Don Chaffee remakes 1940's 1 million BC, a special effects Oscar nominee that featured alligators, armadillos, and pigs prostheticized to look like dinosaurs as 1966's 1 Million Years BC, featuring Harryhausen's more convincing, presumably more convincing, stop-motion beasts. Likewise, Louis Leterrier remakes Harryhausen's own Clash of the Titans from 1981 
in 2010, replacing the earlier film's stop-motion creations with CG titans instead. The future of movies becomes the past. SpongeBob always rounds up. In their various adaptations, Jerry, Alvin, and Pip model this evolving relationship between live action and animation more generally. That is, when Jerry dances alongside Joe Brady, Gene Kelly, or Alvin annoys Dave, Jason Lee, to no end, or Pip mimes to Prince Edward, James Marston, in a diner, we're also watching animation dance alongside, or annoy, or mime live action. In these scenes, the relationship between animation and live action is more or less synchronous, more or less mimetic, more or less continuous, and that relationship often changes from scene to scene as the characters learn to adapt to each other and their environments. Not for nothing does Grind describe hybrid experiments as bipartisan and democratic. Is the live action animated film a party of one or two? And then elsewhere wonder more violently about the infiltration of cartoon technique into live action. These scenes or specimens trace a broad evolution from momentary accords between live action and animation in one-off duets or duels where characters copy or combat each other, to provisional accords where live action and animated characters partner up or group together for some mutual benefit, to more permanent accords where live action and animated characters are so close to each other as to become indistinguishable. While Grin cites the three caballeros as about the only example of animaction at the moment of his writing, he leaves off another recent and surely relevant release from his survey. Metro Goldwyn Mayer's Anchors Away, which debuted only the year before. A romantic comedy about a pair of sailors, Frank Sinatra's Clarence Doolittle and Kelly's Joe Brady, who spend four days of shore leave wooing an aspiring singer, Catherine Grayson's Susie Abbott, critics praise the virtuosic two and a half minute scene midway through the film in which Joe dances alongside Jerry Mouse, who'd only made his debut five years before in the 1940 Hanna-Barbera cartoon Puss Gets the Boot. A handful of films followed in Kelly and Jerry's steps. MGM invited Jerry and Tom to swim with Esther Williams during an eight minute dream sequence in 1953's Dangerous When Wet, Warner Brothers let Tweety and Bugs Bunny run amok alongside Doris Day and Jack Carson in My Dream Is Yours, and Kelly went on to direct himself alongside cartoon co-stars in 1956's balletic anthology Invitation to the Dance featuring an Arabian Nights-inspired hybrid segment and 1967's TV movie musical Jack and the Beanstalk, both with animation by Hanna-Barbera, both prov uh, proving Grin's list yet again prophetic. Anchors Away features many fixations of those mid-century mixed pictures to come. Dreams, analogies, kids, show business, and, relatedly, the fourth wall, against which it knocks just like Coco did all those years before, and through which Spongebob bursts all those years later. Never mind, of course, that these sequences appear exclusively in classical Hollywood musicals whose already heightened realities involve sporadic songs that may or may not advance the plot, but inveterately stress movement, rhythm, and synchronization. Animation in this sense and in these scenes affirms live action's capacity for fantasy rather than vice versa. Consider the live action lead up to Kelly and Jerry's tete a tete. Anchors Away begins with a group of sailors' bodies made graphical as they march, forming first an anchor, then the word navy. This demonstration preludes Clancy and Joe's anointment, where they receive silver stars for their heroism before being granted shore leave. I hate the thought of going ashore, Joe belts, as he and Clarence head out the door to Hollywood, where the rest of the film takes place. And not just Hollywood. A number of scenes are set, so to speak, on the MGM backlot where Clarence and Joe attempt to secure Susie an audition with conductor Jose Iturbi, playing himself as he often did in 1940s musicals. As Clarence and Joe bop around the lot, Joe takes a shine to Susie's young nephew, a sailor-suited blonde boy named Donald, played by the late Dean Stockwell, calling to mind Disney's duck. It's Donald who serves as Joe's and our conduit to the half-animated world, when he asks Joe to tell his class how he earned his silver star. As Joe begins his story, a fuzzy rectangle frame forms on Donald's forehead, in which we see a row of trees, and then Kelly, as Joe, skips by. The frame within the frame grows, filling the screen as Joe continues his story. 
Are we in Donald's fantasy or are we in Joe's? Sydney complicates this question even further as Joe moves through the meadow in slight slow motion, already abiding by a different kind of physics, then falls down a hole and crawls through a tunnel to arrive in an even more cartoonish meadow, a 2D castle in the background. Tunnels also pave the way to two universes in Carol Zaman's Journey to the Beginning of Time and Roger Rabbit. Joe's mission, which he accepts from a cadre of very Disney-like forest creatures, one of whom you can see here, petition the Mouse King to allow dancing and singing in this kingdom again. Joe disappears from view in the foreground and reappears in the background as an animated figure speeding up the stairs to Jerry's tower. There, Jerry relays that he's lonely because he can't sing and he can't dance. Joe asks, will you try? Jerry replies, if you show me. Joe, I'll show you. Jerry, I'll try. Jerry and Joe enter into momentary accord, each mimicking, adapting to the other's movements and rhythms, often in perfect synchronization. By design, of course. Jerry's movements are literally drawn from Kelly's through the process known as rotoscoping. Only once does Joe look at Jerry with anything like consternation when the latter hovers midair after a jump, a cartoonish feat that Joe can't yet replicate. At the dance's end, Jerry bestows an appropriately animated badge upon Joe for his efforts, paralleling the silver star with which the film begins. He is now an honorary tune. In this sequence, Sidney compounds musical fantasy with childhood fantasy with Hollywood fantasy. At the film's end, he parallels the screen within a screen that leads to the Kelly-Jerry dance with shots of Susie singing at last for a turby, her face reflected in a camera lens and then bordered by the black outline of a camera's viewfinder. To swipe a line from Alan Cholodenko's artful essay on the much later, much shaggier Roger Rabbit and its various frames, these textual operations have vertiginous consequences. In that vertigo, Anchors Away imagines a momentary, though impressive, accord between live action and animation, albeit an accord that sometimes extends outside the bounds of the dance's fantasy within a fantasy. The live action environments in Anchors Away, full of frames, shadow play, and wide-eyed adolescence, look nascently hospitable for animated creatures, even if those creatures don't make the leap to the realer world. Instead, or excuse me, indeed, live action animated encounters here and in the films that followed remain one-offs, intrusive rather than immersive fantasies, to borrow Farrah Mendelssohn's distinction. And even in those immersive hybrids, like Harryhausen's mythic B-movies that followed in Anchors Away's Wake, animation remains intrusive, a hypnotic spectacle like The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad's Snake Woman or the titular dinosaur in 1969's The Valley of Gowanji, a momentary foe, a threat to be vanquished. Not until 1988's Roger Rabbit, set between a fantastic noirish LA in 1947, right around the time of Grin's writing, and the even more fantastic Toontown, do we witness a sustained accord between live action and animation on screen. Roger Rabbit fingers live action and animation as reluctant partners in the guise of Eddie Valiant, Bob Hoskins, and Roger, voiced by Charles Fleischer, no relation. Eddie's reluctance to work with Roger stems at least in part from his belief that a tune killed his brother several years prior. Eddie and Roger's investigation into another murder, that of Toontown's owner, Marvin Acme, leads the pair to Judge Doom, Christopher Lloyd, and his weaselly henchmen, who string Roger and his girlfriend, Jessica Rabbit, up ready to douse them with dip. Eddie's learned enough tricks from Roger to save his partner from certain death, distracting Doom's henchmen with a cartoonish song and dance routine sent to The Merry-Go-Round Broke Down, aka the Looney Tunes theme, before turning his attention to Doom, who's revealed to be a toon in human disguise, as well as the man who killed Eddie's brother. An image that, uh, really impressed upon me as a child. I'm not going to look directly at it right now. Eddie's valiance stands in contrast to Doom's more duplicitous hybridity. Unlike in Anchors Away, Eddie's dance isn't synchronized, nor is it a duet. Rather, Eddie strikes out on his loony, tune-like own, having internalized animation's beats and greatest hits. Doom, hiding his animatedness within a live-action exterior, perishes. Eddie, newly wearing his animatedness on his sleeve, survives. The film ends with him surrounded by the denizens of Toontown gazing happily at its horizon. 
Despite Roger Rabbit's happy ending, or more to the point, its hint at the beginning of a beautiful friendship between live action and animation, the film inspired few imitators, at least technically speaking. While some critics attribute Roger Rabbit with Disney's subsequent success during the so-called renaissance of The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King, the film's live action legacies are murkier. Evil Tunes and Cool World, both released four years after Roger Rabbit, made the earlier film's sexual subtext explicit. The former features an animated monster sexually assaulting and then possessing a real young woman. The latter, directed by Bakshi, finds a live-action cartoonist played by Brad Pitt sleeping with an animated femme fatale, Julie, I think you're out there, voiced by Kim Basinger, who wants to be real. Meanwhile, Space Jam, Bugs Bunny's big-budget, family-friendly animated live-action matchup with Michael Jordan, involving many of Roger Rabbit's animators, wouldn't arrive until 1996. No, Roger Rabbit's most logical successor was Casper, the friendly ghost who actually appears in storyboards for an unfilmed Roger Rabbit sequence set at Acme's funeral and who floated onto American cinema screens over Memorial Day weekend of 1995 in a big budget live action adaptation of the Harvey Comics character, executive produced by Steven Spielberg, one of the forces behind Roger Rabbit. Cinefantastique's Dan Pearson described Casper as an unusual meeting of Roger Rabbit and Spielberg's own Jurassic Park, whose mere six minutes of computer animation Casper handily bested with around 350 shots, some 40 minutes, of animated ghouls. In her review of the film, the New York Times' Karen James likewise compared Casper to Roger Rabbit and other Robert Zemeckis productions, Forrest Gump, Death Becomes Her, that combined live action and animation. Along with 1994's The Flintstones, this is a bit from Casper, uh, excuse me, along with 1994's The Flintstones, also produced by Spielberg, Casper led a cycle of hybrid films in the late 90s, aughts, and tens, wherein the cartoon stars of yesteryear, George the Jungle, Rocky and Bullwinkle, Josie and the Pussycat, Scooby-Doo, Garfield, Speed Racer, Yogi Bear, Jim and the Holograms, Woody the Woodpecker, and Tom and Jerry, traded 2D for computer-generated 3D, adapting to their newly live-action environments. At the center of this cycle sits Alvin and the Chipmunks, the 2007 film inspired by Ross Bagasarian Sr.'s diminutive pop trio, whose hit Christmas single The Chipmunk Song, Don't Be Late, debuted in 1958 and launched Alvin, Simon, and Theodore onto comic book pages and TV airwaves in the decades thereafter. And I'll say here as well, Zemeckis was actually attached to a live-action Alvin film or hybrid film in the 90s after a proposed Roger Rabbit sequel fell apart. Alvin and the Chipmunks 2007 revival, followed by three squeakles, each as critically reviled and commercially adored as the last, hits many of the cartoon remake cycle's major notes. First, Alvin and his brothers are modeled, as are Rocky, Bullwinkle, Scooby, Garfield, Yogi, Woody, Tom, and Jerry, on living creatures, great and often small, very much unlike the animated creations more obviously associated with the digital revolution, Jar Jar Binks from 1999 Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, and Gollum from 2001's The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, characters not incidentally whose connection to their respective human counterparts, Ahmed Best and Andy Serkis, remains clear. In this respect, Alvin and company are both less natural in their lack of connection to any such counterpart, and more so in that they're based on real animals. This fact connects to the cartoon remake cycle's second distinguishing feature, a tendency to naturalize its animated leads, cartoonish though they may be. Alvin and the Chipmunks, like Yogi Bear and Woody the Woodpecker, opens outdoors with majestic establishing shots of a forest before settling on the Chipmunks, unclothed, stuffing nuts into a fir tree. Only the Chipmunks' oversized heads atop otherwise realistically textured bodies disturb the image's naturalism. That and the fact that they're singing Daniel Powder's 2005 pop hit Bad Day to Pass the Time. Alvin complains in very adaptational terms that he's sick of struggling for survival, competing with gophers and earthworms and that loser sparrow who always takes his nuts. Luckily for Alvin, a trio of farmers fell the tree, delivering it to an office building in the city where it's adorned with Christmas lights in a wink to the chipmunk's original Yuletide packaging. When the Chipmunks cross paths with aspiring songwriter and part-time ad man Dave Seville, who initially calls them creepy and unnatural, he has to domesticate them, starting by knitting their already iconic red, blue, and green jumpers. 
Midway through Yogi Bear, we similarly, similarly see the titular character voiced by Dan Aykroyd throw his iconic hat and tie aside after Ranger Smith, played by Tom Cavanaugh, tells him he's not smarter than an average bear. Yogi explains to Boo Boo, voice of Justin Timberlake, that he's going to forage for food in the wild to catch some fish with his paws. Alvin and Yogi are just a jumper or tie away from wild, a point that Yogi Bear, the film, stresses by having another park ranger, played by Anna Ferris, remark that talking brown bears are so rare, and that Woody the, and the Woody the Woodpecker film underscores by identifying its eponymous rascal as a pileated red-crowned woodpecker, another rare species worth some half million dollars on the black market. It's the crux of the film. And in scenes that once more recall SpongeBob's wacky climax, Woody and the Chipmunks encounter decidedly unnatural, Google-eyed, inanimate versions of themselves. The former in a decoy laid by money-grubbing hunters, the latter in, yet again, Google and dead-eyed stuffed animals that they use as decoys to fool a money-grubbing record producer, played by David Cross in Alvin and the Chipmunks finale. The Chipmunk Switcheroo signals the live-action cartoon remake's third major tasting note, product placement. Alvin Simon and Theodore decoys are cheap tie-in toys. Excuse me, Alvin Simon and Theodore's decoys are cheap tie-in toys that the record producer manufactures after the trio becomes famous. Surely the film's own tie-in merchandise underwent a more thorough vetting process. Indeed, in one uncanny sense, 3D cartoon remakes bring their central characters more in line with the polyester plush dolls and plastic figurines that they inspired in the first place in their 2D form. Their rounded out forms may in that way look less unnatural than we might think. But these remakes go even more explicitly commercial elsewhere. In, a pro in product placement so shameless that Common Sense Media, a site that provides content info um, for families, notes that the surprisingly mild consumerism in a movie like Yogi Bear is limited to stealth ads for just a few cars. Common Sense cites Alvin for, quote, several scenes involving the chipmunks watching yeah, if you can believe it, SpongeBob SquarePants, the film's director, Tim Hill, was a writer on the show, eating slash heating Vans waffles, and spotlighting brands like Hummer, Porsche, Apple, Bose, and Tabasco. Though the site curiously makes no mention of Utz, whose cheese balls pop up so often in Dave's Kitchen that they should get their own credit. If this product placement serves as a crass reminder of the adaptation's own commercial aspirations, it also chips away at the fourth wall separating Alvin's world from ours. Product placement becomes another form of direct address in movies where characters frequently speak to audiences. I know what you folks are thinking. Woody is a big fat sellout, says the woodpecker at one point. Don't you ever have anything to say? He asks at another. These interjections, coupled with the product placement's more indirect address, yet again collapse the boundaries separating Woody's or Alvin's world from ours in a manner quite different from Anchors Away's fantastic vertigo. More mundanely, we buy into these worlds so that we might buy Uts or Bose or Vans in our own. Appropriately, then, these films tend to end with integration. Woody, Yogi, and Alvin and the Chipmunks all eventually come to some kind of accord with their live-action antagonists, or more often deuteragonists. Woody shacks up with the father and son whose house he'd been intent on destroying. Just because I'm one of a kind doesn't mean I can't be part of a family, too, he says. Yogi ends up drawing visitors to Jellystone Park, much to Ranger Smith's delight, and Alvin, Simon, and Theodore achieve international stardom with Dave's help, but more importantly, get Dave to admit that they are all family along the way. Um, and the first squeakle I should mention ends with the family expanding to include the Chipettes. Of course it does. The animated characters and their live-action counterparts achieve some kind of symbiosis. They cohabitate, they hang out, and room together, all in longer leases and agreements than any we might find in a mid-century hybrid pick. In these living arrangements, Alvin and the Chipmunks and Company arguably set the foundation for some of the most successful live-action animated buddy movies in recent memory, 2012's Ted and its 2015 sequel, 2019's Detective Pikachu, and 2020's Sonic the Hedgehog. I want to conclude today with a very brief look at one last specimen. A fourth chipmunk whose furtive movements in 2007's Enchanted, released the same year as the first Alvin, lead the way to the other most successful live-action animated movies in recent memory, 
movies that indistinguishably integrate live action and animation. Enchanted begins in the animated fairy tale land of Andalasia, but quickly sends its princess Giselle, first voiced and then embodied by Amy Adams, through a magical well to a lively and live action Times Square. When Pip follows after her, he morphs from a 2D wisecracking sidekick in the vein of Mulan's Mushu into a 3D photorealistic chipmunk, no oversized head here, without the gift of gab, in line with the film's fish-out-of-water conceit. I want to mention very briefly here, too, that Spongebob did it before and does it, too, by having Sandy Cheeks transform from a cartoon squirrel into a photorealistic squirrel in, in the second Spongebob movie. The film cements that conceit with a subsequent scene where Giselle, crashing with a divorce lawyer, Patrick Dempsey, after he finds her in the streets, opens the apartment window and sings a melody not unlike Snow White's 1937 well-wishing. Pigeons, cockroaches, flies, and rats come to Giselle's call, helping her clean the apartment in another Snow White riff, this one of that film's happy working song. Elsewhere, Pip can only communicate to Prince Edward, Marsden, who's come to New York looking for Giselle, in charades. While the joke in this scene seems to be Spongebob-like about what happens when Disney characters stop being 2D and start getting real, its punchline is a doozy. Enchanted was released just one year before Iron Man, two years before Disney acquired Marvel, and three years before Disney released Alice in Wonderland, the first film in an ongoing live-action remake cycle and a film that fittingly features a portal from a live-action world to a more animated land. Disney's remakes of The Jungle Book, The Lion King, and The Lady and the Tramp would follow in the decade after, each featuring its own photorealistic animals behaving like their animated forebears, who, unlike in Enchanted, are nowhere to be seen. Disney went so far as to market The Lion King, bereft of any human character, as a live-action adaptation, even while, with the exception of a few establishing shots, everything the light touches is animation. Viewed from this angle, Enchanted looks less like a parody and more like a plan. The live-action environments where cartoons find happy homes in Alvin and its related remakes gives way, in Disney re Disney's remakes, to all-encompassing animated worlds surely in the same orbit as Thor Ragnarok and the galaxies far, far away in another Disney universe. The Lion King remake's Simba may look uncanny when set against his expressionistic predecessor, but he could easily stand as a guardian of the galaxy alongside Rocket Raccoon. In the Disney Cinematic Universe, live action and animation no longer dust it up as they do in Spongebob, no longer tango together as they do in Anchors Away, no longer cohabitate as they do in Alvin. They can't because they're one in the same. Thanks so much. There's my info again.